Um, guys, just uh, just tonight, um, I got invited by Rupert um, to do this talk a couple of weeks ago. So he asked me just to put together a talk on um, just to give you guys an insight into high performance sport and how the um, development of elite athletes, I think, um, contrasts quite closely, uh, reflects, sorry, quite closely in terms of business and performance. So hopefully um, from this talk tonight you'll get a bit of a picture about what we do and then how you can use those um, sort of uh, the way that we look at um, performing in a high performance, high pressure area in sport and how that can um, help affect your, your businesses that you run, each, each individual person here. So that's the main focus of tonight really. So um, at any time in the talk if you've got any questions just, just yell out and, and stop. I don't mind anyone just, just yelling out because... I know myself, if I save questions to the end, I always forget what I want to ask anyway. So if you wanted to shout out, um, that's fine along the way. So hopefully um, we don't have any glitches and it goes all right. So um, I, th I thought I'd just start with just a little bit about me. Um, just to start with, I was born and bred in Sydney in Australia. Um, married to my wife Belinda, she's also from Australia. We have two kids, a uh, little girl, Alana, she's five years old. She's Irish from um, when we used to live in Dublin. And we've had a boy, Joshua, he's eight months old at the moment. He's, you'll be happy to know he's Welsh, he's born in West Wales. So we're just sort of maybe working our way around the, the Six Nations tournaments. I think we might have one in each team <laughs> as we go along. But um, reasonably successful um, sporting career in Australia when I was younger up until 18, uh, till about 19. And then the combination of things, injury and study and other things took over. And um, the way that sport is in Australia, if you haven't made it by the time you're quite young, then it's pretty ruthless and you're gone. But basically, I was um, played for my um, city, which was Sydney, and my state or my region, which is New South Wales, in cricket, rugby league, and AFL. And I got AFL is like Aussie rules. I don't know if a lot of people might have seen that over here. So um, Aussie rules, yeah, AFL, Aussie rules, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's no rules. Well, it's a bit better now. They've cleaned it up a little bit, but it used to be um, people coming at you from all angles, so it was um, it was get in before the other person got in, really, it used to be. But um, when I was 16, I got signed by um, the Sydney Swans, which is a professional club in my city of Sydney, a bit like the Scarlets region. And um, by the time I was 19, I was washed up and hacked and sacked out of there. So... Um, yeah, I really enjoyed growing up in, um, in Sydney and Australia with the um, opportunities in terms of sport. We have quite a vast array of things that we have available to us um, due to a lot of conditions, but we're a very sporting nation, so come in. So we get, we get the opportunity to do a lot of different things in terms of sport, education, and growing up. And I think, um, talking from an athletic background, because a lot of kids growing up in Australia, we've got... Um, so we, we do a bit of everything. We don't really specialise in sports too early. So we might do um, the local surf club. So you go and do the beach and learn how to swim and how to how to sort of manage yourself in the surf. You go and usually when you're little, about three or four years old, you play football or soccer as we call it because your mum won't let you play rugby or rugby league yet because she doesn't want you tackling or getting tackled. Summer's usually cricket. Um, again, all the summer sports like the surf. And then as you get older through school, you get opportunities to do it like all the sports you can imagine, AFL, rugby union, rugby league. So I think when you're young, um, the multifaceted approach um, to learning a lot of different skills, what it does is it helps um, build your ABCs of athletic movement in terms of just generally making you all around good sportsman. And as you're older, 16, 15 odd, you might go into some sort of academy into a specialised area. But basically that's a sort of about a two minute sort of explanation of how things work in Australia and I'm not sure because I don't know the, the grassroots here but I think it's it's one of the reasons why Australia is generally quite successful in different sort of sports because of the amount of um, development I have as youth and what we do is we tend to focus on the, the skill rather than the athleticism in terms of lifting weights and all that sort of stuff that doesn't come until quite a lot later so we've got good um, good sports people who need that extra development later in their career where I've noticed since I've been in the UK, the focus is very much on what happens in the gym, how big you are, how fast you are, how fit you are. And then if you're a good rugby player, tennis player, soccer player, whatever seems to be secondary sometimes, especially in terms of some of the ways they, um, some of the ways, 
they uh, have kids coming into academies. Um, hey. So that, I think that's a big difference in between the two hemispheres in particular, Australia and New Zealand. <coughs> I'm not sure too, too much about Perth Rail. But it's very much about just get out there and do everything you can, anything you can develop your athletic, uh, coordination, athleticism, and then see if you're any good at it when you sort of come towards the end of, of it. Um, so there's a little bit of insight there. Uh, I've worked um, in professional sports since I was 28 years old, so um, just just around about, no, sorry, since I was 26 years old, so just about 12 years now. Um, because I um, finished my athletic career quite early, I, um, I was quite um, dedicated to training and stuff from the ages of 16 to 19, so I didn't probably do a lot of the things that kids that age do in terms of partying and all that, so I decided to do that from about 19 to 22 and I went off around the world and went a bit nuts for a couple of years and then came back to Sydney to study and do um, what I'm doing now because I thought if I can't get paid to be a professional sportsman, then I worked out that the coaches and the trainers get to hang around with them and live a pretty good life anyway, so I thought I'd, I'd try and do that if I couldn't make it. So went back to college and studied sports science and did all that stuff. And um, so I was a bit later as a student. I was 22 to 26, which um, I think gave me a very a good, um, a bit of an advantage over some of the young kids because I know when, if I was 18 in university, I probably wouldn't have been where I am now because I would have been kicked out, I think, at that age. So I think doing what I did and going away and coming back and studying a bit later when I knew what I wanted to do worked out quite well. So currently... Um, I'm head of what they're calling physical performance these days. So physical performance is um, it's changed a little bit the last few years. I was head of strength and conditioning, which is everything to do with strength, power, speed, uh, fitness, rehab, and all that sort of things. Now the physical performance department is strength and conditioning, so all the physical modalities, um, physiotherapy, um, which is obviously the physios, and then medical. So there's three departments that um, I manage now, but I'm head of the strength and conditioning. That's my, still my main role, but I'm managing the physical performance department. So you might hear that word in sport come up now, physical performance managers or athletic performance director or some crap they come up with. But basically, there's one person that goes to the coach and manages all that area. So the coach is not talking to four or five different people. He just wants to talk to one person, which happens to be me. So I don't tell the doctors and um, physios what to do because obviously I'm not qualified, but my job is to manage our 52 players that we have in our squad. Um, through all the aspects of their rehab, fitness or medical and make sure that they're in the right places at the right times and they're on track to, the, to getting to where they are. So the coach just wants to know when he, what's his injury, what are we doing about it and when is he going to be back, that's all he wants to know. He doesn't really care about everything else. So everything else that happens in between is what I help the other guys manage. So that's sort of what that means. I also started my own company back in 2001 in Sydney. It was High Performance Athlete. I'm the director of that and it's starting to, to grow and develop into to do a few different things and that's what Rupert wanted me to talk to you guys about today in terms of business and startups and the opportunities that are out there in these times and also, as I said, how I think that the philosophies and principles that we use in high performance sport can um, flow into your business and help you guys be better at what you're trying to do. Um, in terms of high performance athlete, um, it w as I said, 2001 in Sydney, I started doing it um, back there. Uh, based in the UK since 2003, so I've been over here working in various programs since 2003. Um, obviously, when you're looking at your business, you're looking at what, ho what, how and why. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to design and implement um, elite athletic development systems, structures and programs for elite organisations like the Scarlets, but also for schools and then for the individual athletes. So I saw, I saw a market that within, within um, sporting organisations like the Scarlets, worldwide, that there's, uh, there's the need for someone like myself to come in and implement strength and conditioning and performance structures. Some of the, the way they do that is obviously different all over the world. Um, but if you, if you, like any business, if you have some good systems and they're working and they're producing results, then people want to know what you're doing. So there's an opportunity for me, having developed systems and structures, in, to take my systems and implement them into other programs. And this is across across the world, so I, you guys probably can't see there. But, um, so what I wanted to do was um, I wanted to try and replicate those systems, no matter where it was in the world. 
So there's three ways I could do that. I could go into, um, so how, how would I do that? I could go in on a consultancy basis, which I've done, and assess their program and suggest areas of improvement in terms of what they're doing, their staffing, um, you know, their programs, their equipment, and all sorts. So you know, everything. Just looking at that as a consultant and suggesting and delivering stuff to go forward. I could also have people who I had um, available to me who are experts in my field, but maybe not wanting to be full time in one job. Go out to these people that are approaching me and implement my beliefs and structures and our philosophy through them in terms of a sort of a subcontracting type thing so that wouldn't require me to necessarily be on site. And then also I could be hands on like I am here with the Scarlets with it with an organisation or with a school or I could be hands on with individual athletes. So there was three tiers that I, I thought there was an opportunity for. And rather than just saying, right, I'm gonna go work at the Scarlets or the Waratahs or wherever else, I wanted to be able to commit to one place but also develop systems and structures that would allow me to do other things. So that's what I've been trying to do at the moment. And the why is the most important for me and we'll get onto that later. Um, I don't know if, if anyone here is familiar with the, the TED talks on the internet, some of the people on there talking about leadership, success and whatnot. There's a guy on there called Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K I think it is, and he talks a lot about the why and why you do things and in terms of what and why you do things. So that's quite an interesting thing to have a look at if you get a chance. But We'll go into that a little bit later as we go, go through this. Um, with my company, High Performance Athlete, it's allowed me to work with a number of athletes across a number of organisations um, in all sorts of elite sports, including AFL, Rugby League, Rugby Union, golf, tennis, um, the Olympic, um, all the different Olympic sports. Not that I've worked with every single different Olympic sports, but a couple of different people involved in Olympic sports. So it's been great for me as a practitioner of strength and conditioning that I started off, you know, I come from a rugby league background and AFL and I started off working in rugby league, so um, which I love doing. And then, But then for me to come into rugby union opened up a whole other world because of, it's just an international game. There's a lot more players, a lot more athletes. There's a lot more budgets for the programs. So it was just a totally different world. So to be able to experience, now I've been in, in rugby since... Um, 2004, um, to be able to experience other um, environments and other projects while I'm doing what I'm doing is fantastic for me and it's only made me better at my job. So it's great to have employees like the, the Scarlets who can see the benefit of, um, whilst I spend the majority of my time here, I probably spend about about four weeks or five weeks a year, not all together, just spread around, um, at other programs and up, updating my skills and personal development. So it's great to to be able to have that opportunity, and that's why I like, you know, one of the reasons I like, I'm very happy where I am at the moment. We're also, <coughs> we've also just started recently, is um, we branched out into the corporate market, and um, next year we've got a couple of very interesting projects that I'm really excited about, because it's the first the time that I've been able to go into businesses and help businesses with their, um, with their, not necessarily their structures of how to do business, but their, um, the structures of how they um, health and well-being for their staff, nutrition for their staff. So basically, staff um, staff well-being and performance, and how um, I don't know if many of you have lots of staff, but how important if you if you keep your staff, if you give your staff the opportunity to educate themselves on health, well-being, nutrition, performance, um, team building, and 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 create a why of your company, how much more that'll improve your performance, and then down the line your bottom line. So I've done some work with a couple of companies which is really exciting to do for me because it's a totally different genre for me. So to be able to get into business and look at those things is really exciting and I'm, I'm looking forward to do that um, next year. And there's a whole lot of different programs at the moment that some people are just wanting to come in and talk to their staff about all these things. Some people are wanting to actually run you know, things at lunchtime where their staff go and exercise or they learn about nutrition or they do like a biggest loser sort of competition within their organisation. So there's loads of different things there that's just um, becoming really exciting. Now for me, we talked about why do we do things. For me, why do I do things? I, I was lucky enough, as I said, to have a little bit of a career as I was younger, but I never got to the top. And I, when I um, look back when I was 28 and I started working in, international, well, in elite sport, 
I saw kids come through the program that were just like me when I was younger, but when I was younger, I didn't realise what I was doing and how much I was wasting my opportunity. So for me to have an opportunity to help kids sort of stay on the rails and to um, to realise their, their goals of playing professional sport, whether it be out here or run out on Millennium Stadium, for me, that's, that's why I do it. So the thrill that you get from... Um, seeing kids play for their country. I know these, these guys aren't kids, but this was about two years ago on New Year's Day when we beat the Dragons at home and we had the so-called no-names there because all the internationals were away and we beat the Dragons. I think we won about, I don't know, 9-3 and we defended for the last five minutes. I don't know if anyone remembers, but we held them out. But if you look at that picture there, John Davis, Rob McCusker, um, Reese Priestland, Damien Welsh, that's David Lyons that I'm tackling there. But there's a lot of guys there that have gone on and played for Wales. There's guys there like Damien Welsh, you probably know one knew a few years ago. Richard Hughes there as well. Ben Morgan, they're becoming international players. So <clears throat> to be able to play a part in someone's development like that and see them um, see them reach the top of whatever they're choosing to do, that's why I do this. Like, and all the other stuff that comes with it financially and travelling and all that sort of stuff is, uh, is a bonus. It's also... <coughs> sacrifices for someone like for me who's not from over here to be over here it's a great opportunity for me but also sacrifice of being away from family and stuff back home and missing out on all that stuff but again that just comes with a job and you've got to deal with it but when when you get to to do stuff like this it's fantastic i was lucky enough as well to work with um with leinster in ireland for about four years and um and then I came to the Scarlets and in 2009 I got asked to do the Fiji team who was over in the November series and they played a test against um, Ireland at um, RDS where Leinster play. That day I was standing on the sideline um, re uh, sort of running the water and doing the stuff for Fiji. Johnny Sexton, Sean O'Brien, Rob Carney and Jamie Heasley were making their debut for Ireland and I was like from here to there away from watching them sing the anthem for the first time. So things like that you know, they're very special and I just hope that peop within business I think it gives you a great opportunity to th do things that are special and to make a difference so if you can do that for me that's the why and if you can find what what your why is then I think it makes it a, a bit easier to get up in the morning just in terms of high performance athlete as I said it started just in my in my hometown back home it was a small little business or well, basically I started being a personal trainer because I had to pay my way through college then I started doing strength and conditioning for my local rugby team and then that grew into something else and that grew into something else. Again, very passionate about what I did and hopefully I was doing a good job. And then from that, starting in 2001, in 2012 I've had the opportunity to work with some, some great, um, I probably, in my field, some big organisations, there's some logos there that you probably all recognise. So from starting off in my backyard back home in Sydney, if someone said he'd worked with Fiji Rugby back in 2001, I probably wouldn't have ever believed it. But, um, you know, it's a great opportunity. And then since I've been over here with the Scarlets and also um, I've been doing some work with um, McKenna's Peninsula Golf and Country Club. Um, I don't know if anyone knows McKenna's, the golf club in Clancy, but they have a gym there. So, um, excuse me, I worked with Jim Anderson, who's the owner, on... He wanted to implement some new systems and structures in there, so... I, I did some stuff for him down there and we, we now provide the staff for his gym down there. So again, that's another another thing that's just come up through through doing what I'm doing. And through that, it's able me to, we've got some guys in here who come in and work in the Scarlets on a voluntary basis because they're doing a sports science degree. Now, I know I've done I've gone down that track, but I, I wouldn't really recommend to kids that they do a sports science degree because there's just no jobs out there at the moment. But the thing that we do at the Scarlets is we offer one year internships. So they come here on a year out and they work hands on in our program with the Scarlets and the Academy. So this year we got four guys who are doing that. And they don't get paid, it's a voluntary internship, but it's, it's a huge experience. And we've had over the last four years, I think we've had 10 guys and girls who have gone through that program. So we're hopefully pushing those people out into the workplace. But through my association with the McKennis now, I'm able to get them some work in the gym where they get paid for, which is great for me because it's some money and experience in another side of the business which they may have to go into because everyone wants to do strength and conditioning or work with the teams, but like in Wales, there's only four professional rugby teams. So as you can imagine, there's not many jobs. So the reality is you've got to look at working in gyms, you've got to look at personal training, you've got to look at niche marketing into all those sort of things. So to be able to set up things for those guys 
through what we can do here is, is fantastic as well. So it's a good opportunity and, a, and again a good relationship that we've built in the local area in the last four years. <coughs> I don't know if you can see that yellow stuff, but this is like where we want to take this next year with a high performance athlete. Obviously my main role is with the, with the Scarlet who's doing what I'm doing here. Um, with helping monks develop their, their gym and their facilities down there. Also got some opportunities coming up with uh, kids' health and wellness. Now, I don't know if you've seen the media lately, but it's disgusting, really, the stats that are coming out in terms of, I think it's nearly a third or a quarter of kids by the time they're six are obese. By the time they finish primary school and get to 11, it's even higher, somewhere over 33, 35%. So these kids these days, we all know what they're like. I know my daughter, she's five years old. She can already use a computer. She can already flick around an iPhone and like she knows what she's doing. Kids aren't moving. Kids aren't being educated on nutrition. I think parents from, I know how easy it is to just give them something and shut them up. Parents are being lazy. So what we want to try and do next year is develop through the Scarlet's, again, with all the facilities we've got here, some sort of kids activity and let's move program. So that's something we're working on at the moment. Um, also, corporate health and wellness, again, um, ridiculous stats again in the press like recently, 40% of men and 45% of women's cancers and killers that are, that are um, killing people in the UK are diseases, that, preventable diseases, okay, so like type 2 diabetes and cancers like um, colon cancer, prostate cancer, all things that are brought on by environmental factors. So again, trying to talk about, you know, for you guys in your corporate health and wellness programs is trying to educate your staff or whoever, or even yourselves on how to be a better, you know, healthier, feel better and then more productive at the end of the day. Because in business, obviously, the more productive we are, um, you know, it's better for, for all around, for the, whole, for the whole company, for everything. So that's something we're looking at as well. So um, there's always, um, different avenues to to focus on, and I think maybe sometimes you think, well, it's you know, cleverly Kamar and she maybe there's not a lot happening there, but I think there's a lot of lot of scope for businesses to get involved, especially if you can all work together and and work in within each other's um, complement each other's skills. So that's just a little bit about what I've done here in the last four years um, in terms of you know coming into a region like this and not really having known anywhere in my company sort of sort of just being sort of plonked here and then getting to know getting into the community and then trying to to get in, involved and do things with the community uh, now I have got a few advantages in terms of being involved in the Scarlets and um, but really I, I just uh, things happen I approach from Kenneth the next thing I meet the owner he tells me he's got a sore back I was rehabbing him the next thing he wants me to run his whole gym so just little things is those sort of networking things that you guys are obviously in enjoy and, and know to give you give you benefits otherwise you wouldn't be here that, that's how things happen just like that little things just lead to something else um, so you know not just because of who I am I think it's just it's just because like all you guys you're probably passionate about what you do and you, you spend your time trying to, to be better at what you do and then look always looking for opportunities so even in this economic climate and all those sort of things are all excuses I think there's a big opportunities out there to move forward so in terms of um, how does sport and business um, come together, I think it's very, very, very close to in terms of in high performance sport, the competition area is extremely un unforgiving. So if anyone was here on uh, Saturday watching the Scarlet play Munster, you know, we lost the Heineken Cup game by three points. We probably bombed about four tries. We probably missed about eight points. Uh, Munster didn't really play that well. They came like they always did with energy and bravado and they just went for the whole 80 minutes we made errors and we lost three points we lost the game by everyone was watching that game everyone went was anyone here yeah so everyone's got their own views on the scallops right everyone walked away from that game going well i walked away from that game you know i know i'm involved but just watching it and thinking how did we lose that game how many tries did we bomb how many forward passes did we go how many kicks did we miss now we never we're never going to say it's that person's fault but we got to the arena is extremely unforgiving because your weaknesses will be highlighted and they will be exposed and teams like Munster that's what they live and breathe off they look for weaknesses they target it like sharks in water in bloody water and they just attack 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 until that's they get what they need from it then they go to the next feed that's what they do and that's why they're good so in our environment every week 
we're going up to a challenge and we're putting ourselves out there to be exposed so there's nowhere to hide so we have to prepare accordingly in terms of preparing accordingly from my side of things I'm not this I'm talking about the physical performance of our players not not anything on the rugby side that's a whole another subsection of our business which I'm sure you know I suppose you've got sales marketing admin production so my area is just the physical preparation so we have to prepare accordingly so there's no room for there's no fluff there's no fads there's no gimmicks we do what we know works and we get players to be in their best physical shape to play and and help us be better that's all that's all we can do um, so I, I believe that high performance sport and business are very similar environments I think obviously we talked about if you if you fail to prepare you prepare to fail if you from my point of view if I haven't got those players physically prepared for battle then we aren't we aren't gonna we aren't gonna win now it's hard because you've got you know, 15 players, you know, 20, a few subs, so we've got 23 players we're trying to have in physical peak for one week. It doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. We've got 10 players are feeling good, five players are injured and playing because they don't want to not play. Boys on the bench aren't happy because they're on the bench. So there's all these things going on, just like in your workplace. There's all these outside factors. But what we need to do is we need to, from my point of view, is we need to prepare physically. So I, I like when we run onto the field it's almost like oh, I'm handing that team to Nigel and go Nigel we couldn't have these boys in any better shape if I've done that in my week I'm happy if I haven't I'm pretty upset now in sport as in maybe there's a little bit different in business because in sport like rugby we have to constantly review performance of our group so our team which is the end product that you people see of our personnel which includes me and all our staff, rugby, commissioning. Um, so that's our personnel, when I say personnel, and our staff, so, sorry, our personnel, our players, and our staff in terms of our coaching group. So every week, like this morning, um, the boys had a recovery yesterday, the, the coaches are doing their review this morning, we have a management meeting, and we sit down and go, right, what happened? What went good, what went bad, how can we be better? Every week. So. This is where I think that this can come across in the business, constantly reviewing your performance, whatever business you're in. You know, it's, you know, it's pretty tangible with us. We either win or we lose, but sometimes we lose and we're happy with our performance because the boys couldn't have done any more and we just got beat by a better team. Not last week, okay? So it's a whole different feeling. So in, con in sport, we're constantly reviewing our performance, our personnel, our staff on a weekly basis. I am constantly put under pressure with Brad, what's happening with this guy? Why isn't he this? Why isn't he that? You know, the coaches might say, someone might say, he's not fit enough. His footwork's not great. You know, he's not strong enough. It, he's too slow. So I can't sit there and go, well, well, I just got to sit there and go, okay, take everything on board and then enhance, enhance those abilities in each player. Okay, so in, in our environment, it's quite easy to review because we have to on a weekly basis. And then at the end of the season, when we get our block of time without games, then we look at what's the most important thing for that player and then they just basically do that for pre-season and that's how they get bigger and stronger and faster or whatever it be, better at rugby. So I think this is a very, this is great for me because every week you just keep getting better. If you don't, you stick your head in the sand and you, you don't. So I think this is where business can take a massive leap out of sport in terms of high performance sport. And this is the difference between high performance sport and recreational sport. Recreational sport, it doesn't matter what happens, win or lose, it's just there for people to do something, keep fit, keep healthy. But when we're talking about high performance sport, there's pressure, there's budgets, there's marketing, you know, there's so many things that rely on what happens out there that it's pretty big business. So like for me, I'm responsible for our 52 players' um, physical wellbeing. Now, our 52 players adds up to four and a half million pounds, I think, of worth of players. So, you know, if you were looking after an area of your business that was worth four and a half million pounds, you, you're under a bit of bit of pressure there. Now, that's not saying, well, you know, pressure, but it's just a challenge that, and that's a fact. And then, you know, on top, those four and a half million players probably generate, I don't know, whatever they generate to keep this place going. So, you know, it's, it's, it's seamless, like, as in your business, there's core things within your business that drive other things. So the good thing about what we do is we review weekly, so hopefully things don't get too out of hand.
but that's not always. So for me, the good thing about reviewing every week and sitting down and talking a lot as a group, like in our management meetings, um, there's myself who represents the performance department, as I mentioned before, the doctors and the physios. So I go into those meetings and I represent strength and conditioning, doctors, physios. Simon Easterby, Mark Jones, uh, Yoan Cunningham is an academy coach, also does stuff with us, Vernon Cooper, uh, and Nige. Okay, so there's a couple of other guys that come in every now and then. Uh, Gar Jenks comes in every now and then. Garen Evans is in there as a team manager. So there's 10 or 11 people in there talking about the scarlets and just telling it as it is. There's no, there's no, you know, quarters taken and there's there's no there's no sort of grudges held. It's just say what you think and let's get on with it. So it's a very performance at sort of orientated environment. So, but what do you need to be successful? So for me, the thing that we, the thing I need to do is I need to. I need to have some pretty clear principles in terms of what I'm going to do with my players in terms of strength and conditioning. If I've got my principles, then I can move forward. If Nigel's questioning me every week about things and I'm not really knowing what I'm doing, I haven't got a plan, then I've got nowhere to go. So I think what the first thing you need to ask in business is what is it that you need to be successful? Now for me, um, as I said, So principles for me, uh, we've got some pretty clear principles within our strength and conditioning and medical department in terms of it's just a given, this is what has to happen, okay, and then we, we move forward. Now methods often change, you might have heard that saying that in regards to principles, methods often change but principles never do. Now there's loads of different ways to get someone fitter, stronger, faster, to do rehab, to do flexibility, but I've got my own ide ideas and systems and my our staff all throw their hats in the ring, so we've got a pretty clear system in terms of how we get players forward. But in terms of the principles and the areas that we work on, they, they, they don't change. The methods do. Ospreys probably tr do totally different to us, so do the dragons, so do the thing. There's loads of different methods, but the principles and the core of your business, I don't think can change. And that's what I hope to sort of um, visualize with you guys in the next couple of slides. So for me, Again, I don't know if you can see that too well, but in the core of that is a rugby player. So what we do with our 52 players is we do a needs analysis. So as a group, what are our needs? Now, the Scarlet's needs of a rugby player are totally different to a Leicester's needs of a rugby player. I can't come in here, haven't been at Leinster, and say, right, this is what we did at Leinster, off you go. It doesn't work like that because it's a different program, different players, different philosophy. Although Leinster and Scarlet's are probably more similar than any other team. But like we, we couldn't train like Leicester because they've got a totally different game. That's why these, these core biomotor abilities are things that never change. It's just the way the team plays and the methods that the teams employ can change. So from a rugby player's point of view, they need to have speed, they need to have strength, they need to have endurance, flexibility and coordination. Now they're the five sort of uh, physical abilities that never change. Now for it, depending what p position you are, like a front rower probably needs to be strong, flexible, and have a pretty good fitness base, and they probably don't need too much speed. So then we've got areas within that are more important than others, and then we work on that. Not saying that they don't do any speed work, but it's something that you know we need to look at the other areas first. Backs probably different; they need to have some speed and power, maybe a little bit less endurance because they get more time between activities. They still need to be fit, yeah, but. We need to know what are the core things that a rugby player needs to do. So a needs analysis, just like for your business, you need to do a needs analysis and look at where you are now and what are you marking yourself against, what standards you're up against. Standards. What are the gold standards for your, um, for your business, you know, for, for rugby? We've got a pretty clear set of standards for our strength and conditioning of our players. So we've got standards for what, and specific tests to test fitness, speed, strength, agility, flexibility. And once they've done those tests is that we, we put those players into categories in terms of position, and then they have a ranking against the world standard, like gold standard, industry gold standards for those positions throughout the world. So we can say, Nigel can say where he's at, he goes, he's at here. It's below average, we want him to get into there. Now when he gets to there, he's world standard prop in strength, conditioning, speed. That's where he's at. 
So if he's got work-ons, we know it's maybe it's not conditioning, maybe it's more, okay, it might be a scrummage technique for a prop or catching and passing thing. But we know that those physical attributes are where we need them to be. And again, that can, re that can be sort of transferred into business where you look at your staff or your business and you say, okay, what do we need? And then we look at our individual people within those departments and say, you know, where are their strengths and weaknesses and what's the most important area? Where, where are those strengths and weaknesses on a, on a global scale, on a ranking system or on our, our own standards? And then how do we get them better at those areas and which area is more important? You know, we, we've got four or five main areas that we focus on, but we can't do everything all at once. We'll generally pick an area, improve it, and then move on to the next thing. So that's how I think you guys can use that sort of thing in business. So we, as I said, we've got our gold standards that we can rank our players throughout their position for each component and for each com position. So with, you, with, with our standards, our standards are constantly moving. So that the, the average and the elites and the below average, they're constantly changing as our players get bigger, stronger and faster, as it is with all numbers, averages and standard deviations, it keeps pushing things up higher and higher. So assessment is key. If you, if you aren't assessing, if we're, if we're talking going back to what does it take to be successful, if you don't assess, well, how do you know? So I think weekly assessment is what we do. Weekly review is what we do. We have core... Um, areas within our, our business that we know that we must have to be successful and we're constantly reviewing, constantly assessing people where we are. And we don't do fitness tests every week, we, do them, we probably do them once every six to eight weeks so we know from my point of view where the boys are. So where are we with these diagnostic tests? Where are we as a group within these in terms of where are the scarlets as a group against you know, world standards in all those areas? Are there any areas of urgent concern? Um, a few years ago, the, the program was a little bit different and when I came here, the Scarlets told me the urgent concern for them was to get their forward back bigger and stronger and to be more dynamic. So that was an area of concern a few years ago. Is there, um, within the areas of concern then, how do we develop individual performance plans? Because we've got 52 players and they've all got individual needs. So how do we, in, how do we develop those individual plans so that they all, they're all constantly getting better? And then how do we implement them? It's all right having a plan, but how do we implement them? We implement them by, by we have to have the staff to do it. So we've got 52 players. So if we want to give individual attention, um, we need to have enough staff so that we look after, say, eight to 10 players each. So we're not trying to look after 25 players. So we can, we can intensify the coaching process by having a, couple, by a few more staff in our department um, to, make, to intensify the coaching process and improve the collective of the Scarlet's physical performance, which is going to hopefully get them to win more games, which is going to hopefully get people to buy more tickets, to win tournaments, so it's going to drive revenue. Because when I ask for more staff, they're going to say they can't afford it. If I can show them how it's going to affect the bottom line and how we're going to improve the squad, um, then it's only going to be better for everyone. And I think we've shown that over the last few years with um, the, the cost cutting that has happened here. We've had a lot of young players, we've had to physically improve them quite quickly and we've got them up to an international standard because a lot of them have proved that on the, on the, on the main stage. And obviously our um, results have improved as well. So the next step is to develop that and then to be a team that starts challenging and winning for stuff. That's our next step. We're not a development team anymore. We've got to go from a team that's come through transition to a team that's got a challenge and be like a monster or Leinster type thing. People are saying, oh, they're going to win stuff. That's our next challenge. Now, with our rankings and stuff, again, where does each player rank within his position? So we can, we can say, because we know what our core needs are for our business in terms of physical development, because we do assessments, we know where each player is in, in all those different core areas of their business. So if you had a salesperson that you know, was, was good at um, cold calling, possibly um, marketing, but not very good on the phone, or, you know, I'm not too sure on all the different things, but you know what I mean? There's probably five or six different areas of a salesperson that they need to be good at. Now, if you did an assessment and you had standards in each of those areas, you could say, okay, Brad, you're doing well as a salesman, but in the next month you're working on this, and we want you to get better at this. So you're picking areas of specificity and improving those within the player. And then, like, we're pretty, um, I suppose, 
ruthless in our environment that we rank the players, we put it on the sheet and we just put it up there and say, right, in your position, the second round, you are fifth in strength, you are sixth in this, you're first in that, but you're last in that. So they, it's out there for everyone to see. Now, whether you can do that in business, I, I don't know, but I think it definitely drives performance if you can make people accountable, give them um, standards, assessment, um, and making it a fair judgment, obviously, but they can all understand that how their assessment improves, and I think that's where we are able to improve performance as a group because we can be quite ruthless in those areas and just put things out there and be honest without being, you know, downgrading to anyone as well at the same time. Where are they within their position, squad, the world? Where is our squad as a group? So constantly evolving, constantly looking at each other. So when Nigel asked me, oh, we, we lost on the weekend, you know, the boys aren't fit enough, well, hang on a minute. Don't just go saying that because we lost. Here's the facts, the facts are X, Y, and Z. Now, if I don't have them, I'm in the meeting going, well, yeah, well, well, well. you know, coaches are very reactive, but we, that's why we've got to have these things behind us because not only because we know that we want to improve our squad, but we've also got the facts there because people can get quite emotional, as you know, when these sort of things, not just in our environment, but just in all environments. So the facts are, are good to have rather than... In terms of um, implementing the individual performance enhancement program, the whole reason behind that is once we've done all that stuff, we know what we need to improve, we've assessed we have a set of standards and we have rankings, then we just need to build that into our week. So to improve the individual, we make sure that their week reflects what they need to improve. So from our side of thing, it might be extra conditioning, extra speed, extra weights, extra nutrition, extra coordination, extra flexibility, extra rehab, whatever it is, their program's different. So the first day they come back into training, they do their reviews and skills, and then we have what we call individual performance enhancement sessions, so rather than everyone just going to the gym. Some guys go to the gym, some guys go to extra fitness, some guys go to extra speed, some guys go and see the physios and do rehab, some guys don't do any in athletic performance stuff because they don't really need to. Some guys go and catch and pass and kick and do rugby stuff. So the whole idea is that once you've done those assessments is how do you implement into that program because Nigel well, people could say, well, yeah, that's great, but we haven't got time to do all that. Well, my job is to show him how we can constantly improve during the week whilst also keeping in mind that Saturday is our big performance day. So what we're trying to do is improve the individual. Remember, we've got 52 individuals within our group, and then hopefully they'll have an improvement on the collective and the scarlets um, in general. And then the end result, which is what we're all trying to get, is we're trying to get that success success in, sorry, I, know I don't have a Rabo direct thing, but Magnus League, which is our week-in, week-out competition, success in Heineken Cup, which is what we are judged by, Heineken Cup, and then success by our local players hopefully running out onto Millennium Stadium with a red shirt. So when we go back and think about, you know, how do we, how do we promote, what does it take to be successful, I don't really know, but all I know is in my department, there's, four, there's five or six core areas of my business that I've got to know where each of my 52 players are and then I've got to assess in that. When I've got those standards, I've got to assess them in those areas and then I've got to put in a program to get them better. So that's all I know and I just hope that uh, it has an effect. So I think hopefully that um, you can see by that presentation is how I think um, what we do in, in high performance sport can have an effect on business and I'm not sure, I'd be interested in hear your thoughts and your feedback but how many of you obviously review, how many of you are constantly assessing your performance of your business, your staff and, your, and maybe your products and, and how often do you, tr do you try and move things forward so um, thanks for your time this evening but I'll, you know, I look forward to any questions or feedback really.